Good afternoon, everyone. It is now 5 p.m. I'm calling this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the San Francisco Unified School District Board of Education's Buildings and Grounds Committee. My name is Ann Shu, and I'm the chair of this committee. Um, please note the presence of Commissioner Sanchez and myself here. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for um, coming to tonight's attending tonight's uh, board meeting. And um, to, uh, San Francisco Unified School District provides free Spanish and Cantonese interpretation service for tonight's meeting. So if uh, anyone needs this service, we'll uh, call the numbers, and um, I will repeat these numbers in uh, Chinese. And our Spanish interpreter uh, is on her way. 歡迎大家參加我們今晚的特別會議 um, so, um, sorry, I cannot speak Spanish, but I'm going to announce the uh, number for Spanish parents to call in to the Google Meet. And the number is 1-319-382-9676. Pin number is 665-996-976. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have two informational items on the agenda today. And we will start with the first one, which is the uh, facilities bond program update. Great, Commissioners. Uh, Lucinia Berry is going to do most of the presentation tonight. It is focused on the bond program, but I do at the end have a few notes, follow-ups on the custodial services analysis um, as requested by Commissioner Shu. So with that, I turn it over to Lucinia Berry, our bond program manager. Okay, great. Good evening, Commissioners. Lucinia Berry. Um, I see our slide changer just ran away, so I'll do a little bit and then... Um, wait for her to come change the slides. We're gonna do a, a pretty similar walkthrough um, to the way we've been approaching the last few months, um, adding a little bit of content from um, commission, uh, this committee's requests from the last couple of months. Um, if you just skip to slide th three, please, with the picture on it. Um, this is the construction highlight for this month, the steel coming up out of the ground for the Hillcrest new building project. Go ahead, skip. Um, next slide. Active construction is continuing on three project sites, APG and Eni, Thurgood Marshall, and that new building project at Hillcrest. Uh, we are in punch list and close out for nine other projects. Um, on the next slide, you'll see construction updates that include Marina, Hill, Marina and the Hillcrest modernization because we're still in construction demobilization there. Next slide. All right. Okay. So this George Washington High School, we are um, putting up the new pan the the new panels on the roof, um, exterior doors being finished, and the auditorium and the shop buildings. Um, at Marina, we're in final punch list there. At Hillcrest, the new building, structural steel, uh, is coming up as you can see again here in this photo. Um, and also the re-roof has begun on the modernization side, which is the last phase of the modernization project. A Thurgood Marshall, um, we've, we're starting the abatement on the final classroom phase and working with Public Works for to, to complete some sidewalk work. And then at APG Nini, um, removing interim housing on the upper yard and um, continuing with electrical work at the gym building. Um, this next section is our spending and contracting summary. Um, it's 
we're trying to make this a bit routine so you know what you're looking at, which is why we kept the top one in there, even though there was nothing over 100,000 for May of 22. No major contracts. Uh, if you look at the expenditures from May, um, this you can see again that the bulk of the expenditures is in construction and construction management, indicative of where we are in um, the bond spend down. But there is some um, design and pre-con costs, which really for BVHM. Um, next slide. In terms of change orders, there was only one change order that came before the board in May. It was Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall is currently at five and a half percent change order and looks trending to be under 10 percent at completion. Um, and this committee also requested a monthly update on the reallocation. So go ahead to the next slide. Bonavista Horace Man is its own item. So I'm going to skip that for now. Yes, I uh, can I interrupt? Should we, since you have these in the segments of the bond program and then the reallocation, if we had questions, should we kind of do this one first, or would you prefer us to wait till the end? Well, the real, I mean, it's all part of the same. The reallocation is bond funds too. So it's up to you. I mean, I'm open, but. Just keep going. Okay. Mission Bay, you all know, we were here last or two Tuesdays ago. Um, for a special meeting when the board approved the technical items, CEQA and the design build contract. Uh, we will be bringing the land acquisition hopefully in August, um, pending some final items with Public Works. Uh, we had our kickoff meeting today with the team as well. So moving forward. Um, the schoolyard improvements, we did an application, open application to all school sites for an outdoor learning um, funds that closed on June 7th. We received 66 applications. You can see the distribution of the applications in the map, pretty good geographic distribution across the city. The lower graphic is the front cover sheet of the um, of the application, just for reference. Um, we will uh, are forming an application committee, and we'll meet this summer. Also, uh, looking to hire a project manager to hopefully have somebody to implement those projects from our side. Next. Site security, uh, the first scope of the security work that we're, take, we're tackling is the door locking hardware. We're scoping needs across the district and start bidding projects this summer. Uh, the facilities division has also completed a draft inventory of other security features to use as a tool to prioritize security improvements moving forward after the hardware. The Southeast uh, facility improvement plan, we are continuing with general planning. Um, Dawn has been involved in a very intensive stakeholder engagement effort, and um, the there is an update that the Leola Havard Early Education Program is relocating to Carver uh, in time for fall, I believe. Mm -hmm. Timeline. Next, on portable air cleaners. Um, oh, did I skip one? Oh no, Port no worries. That's okay, portable air cleaners uh, have been installed in all classrooms, libraries, and cafeteria spaces, as well as multi-occupancy offices. Okay, so also last month, this committee requested an update on the facility condition, ass condition assessments. Um, this slide shows, thank you, this slide shows the scope, um, the number of buildings, which is all of them, the, the scope and the deliverables for the AFCA consultant contract. And then next slide, the scope is broken down into eight groupings of school sites and admin sites. Um, you can see where we are with the today marker. We've made it through um, three of the groups and continuing to get data and review it and clean it and send it back to the consultant to finalize and taking up the rest in succession as they come in. We have some preliminary information um, the next slide has a chart that as an indicator of the overall progress of the work to now um, and a note at the bottom, you can see that the purpose, one of the purposes of the FCA is that once complete, they'll be, become a part of the capital plan that then inform priorities, both for the next bond and for the facility divisions work generally. Um, the next slide is a preliminary sort of map that shows um, the, the preliminary results, again, the data still being finalized, but the green being the best condition, darkest green being the best condition, the red being the poorest condition, and the grays be meaning yet to complete. The next slide shows that same data in a different way. Um, 
again, the, the darkest green being the best and the red being the most efficient. Um, and then, so the next segment is the monthly project highlight, which um, this month is Hillcrest Elementary Schools, uh, most, mostly the modernization project. Um, most of the modernization is uh, complete, the existing school is complete, and construction of the new classroom building is ongoing, as you saw in the prior photos. The re-roofing of the existing building is also ongoing, needed to be a summer project, initiated pretty much the day after the students left the site this year. Uh, some of the windows in the existing building were also delayed um, due to COVID-related supply chain issues, which we've seen pretty much across our construction program. So both of those are being completed now, moved into the new building project funding source really only, and are being completed this summer. Um, the overall cost for the modernization project is 13.7 million. Go ahead to the next slide. You can see the new windows and painting um, the teal paint is all new. The bluish paint there on the stairwell is also new. Um, next slide. We did uh, the main hallway was renovated, a new paint, new finishes, new lighting in the hallway. Some before and after photos of the entry um, where we basically just muted the color palette, repainted the outside. Next slide shows the before and after of the cafeteria. So really dramatic change in this place, really nice new communal lighting, um, much nicer, fresher space and graphics on the walls. And a before and after also very um, a big transition in typical classroom site. You can see the old on the left and the new on the right, no worries. And then I just wanted to highlight I know Commissioner Shu has been interested in this as well as several members of the public just improvements Sorry, you can skip through to the next one improvements to the bond program website. We're just going to flip through some slides so you can see um, what we've been up to trying to create a navigable and easier to use website you can keep going. Um, the next slide shows uh, the bond programs page that you can see now really the only one that's been populated so far is the 2016 as we start to add 2016 projects up there but soon enough the 2011 and 2006 programs will have information as well. Go to the next one we're populating our financial reports page two we have. Um, the 20 to 21 bond financial report that's highlighted on the page right now that you can look at. The next one is a typical project page we've built through Good Marshall. It doesn't look like this side by side, it scrolls, but just to fit it on the slide, just so you could see a typical project page would have either a rendering or a photo of the completed project, some information, a dashboard that has some information about the expenditures and how we're trending in terms of budget and schedule. Uh, and then uh, the project schedule will also be on every project page and there's about six or seven up there up there now. Um, into performance metrics also um, requested by this committee um, we've just been updating them monthly from what happened last month we did make um, a change, so this one um, is estimate to bid we haven't put any new projects out to bid, so there are no changes here from last month. Um, the project schedule one, um, the next slide. In response, uh, Commissioner Shu, to your comment, we removed uh, the projects that are ongoing because they don't have useful data about schedule adherence. <laughs> um, and so this is up to date. Um, the next one is change orders. This is new information. Well, this is a new graphic where we're looking at um, at change orders and uh, performance of change orders. There are some here that that are, of course, higher than we want at 20 and 21 percent. George Washington and Claire Lilienthal. Uh, both of those projects had major unforeseen conditions um, that were not included in the original bid. We can, to the extent that you guys want to talk about that, you know, uh, available. The information is available. And the next slide is uh, an example of the kind of analysis that um we're doing in the bond program right now to understand change orders uh, this is what we're considering a typical project shared in elementary 
uh, the final change order coming in at 16 and a quarter percent and just trying to really start to understand why and what we can control and what we can do. Um, so the biggest obvious error place for for the district to to make some changes ongoing is in the owner requested the orange band, which in this case makes up 38% of the change order. Um, and so, you know, that's homework I think, for the bond program to do in the future. Um, to figure out how to improve some projects. That's the end of my slides, but I know Don has some additional information. Yeah, commissioners, I wanted to follow up. Uh, we had a good conversation when we presented on our custodial services uh, service level analysis, and Commissioner Shi requested just to follow up on the updates. And I think um, broadly, I think the disappointing news here is there hasn't been much progress because we're still running right now a 20% vacancy rate of our existing staffing. So before we can talk about achieving efficiencies and improving service, we still very much have to just keep pace with kind of the, the great retirement and the great resignation that I think is impacting companies and organizations across the country um, is impacting SFUSD custodial services as well. And so unfortunately, um, even though we continue to hire um, and have now um, hired you know, several dozen positions, we are experiencing retirements and resignations at equivalent rates. So we have not been able to make up ground. Um, this is concerning for us uh, as we are focused right now in summer, which is actually kind of our most intense love, uh, intense time of year, actually, as the facility services team preparing schools for reopening. And so we are continuing to aggressively pursue recruitments and also will most likely have to augment that with additional resources um, in order to make sure that schools are in the shape that we want them to be at the beginning of August. So. Um, I think the recruitment challenges that we're facing are not only uh, in terms of custodial services itself and those vacant positions, but also the fact that our HR team as a whole is under-resourced. And so we have one analyst for almost 100 recruitments. Um, and that is, you know, that's, that's not a sustainable workload or um, one that is also easy to make progress on. So we set clear priorities and really have a deep appreciation for the support that we've received, but um, we are both, I think, suffering from our own challenges, replacing our custodial workforce. And again, where we are compensating folks at a pay rate that is, you know, in some cases, 20%, 15% less than the city offers for the same job classes. And then when you layer on top of that, the length of the recruitments and the difficulty completing them, um, we are at a competitive disadvantage. So uh, that is our update. Commissioners, if you guys have questions. Oh, sorry, I think public comment first. Yes. Any public comment? Wonderful to see Mr. Ridgway. Hi, everyone. You can, Rex Ridgway for the record. <laughs> you, you can have up to five minutes. It, it won't take that long. <laughs> OK, well, thank you anyway. Uh, slide number 11. Uh, regarding the 14 million um, for the outdoor learning, uh, I was text some questions to ask. So if if uh, you could look at slide 11, while I'm, I'll just ask the questions and we can get feedback. Um, are the uh, unified of uh, the district's other 66 plus schools able to submit and still apply, um, even though they've missed the deadline? That's question number one. Number two. There are 60, 66 schools who've applied by the deadline. Um, what are the decision-making eligibility criteria? What are the facilities plan to ensure that the 14 million be dispersed equitably and in a timely manner? What are the funds, uh, how are the funds turned into actual improvements at the school sites? Um, and, are the sites provided with facilities, procurements approved by catalog? And are the dollars amounts that they send, uh, will they be shopped around? I'm, I'm not really understanding the, the question, but uh, it just basically, I guess I can sum it up that the, four, the 14 million is available, 66 schools got their applications in on time. Um, if there's any leftover money, would they be available to schools that haven't? Would those schools that haven't submitted be allowed to submit? That's slide number 11. 
And then slide number 34, I have a question because it's all in one presentation. So if you could go to slide 34, please. I just have a question on the key. If on slide 34, at the top of 34, you'll see there's an L for, there you go. And it's for late, uh, low bidder turnout. So my question there is, what does low bidder turnout mean? And even though there's low bidder turnout, why does that automatically put those particular projects in cost overruns? Um, so, yeah, okay, low bidder project question, what does that mean? Number two, does that automatically mean because it's low bidder turnout, we have overruns? So that's my two questions. Thank you so much. I'm not sure we were we are supposed to answer, but actually a lot of the I had the same questions. So when we get there, I think Mr. Rich will, will get his answers because they're already my questions. Um, but I'll let the commissioner Commissioner Sanchez go first. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually I have similar questions as the public commenter as well. So if you have any responses now. Uh, to any of those questions. Sure, commissioners, I believe that we are kind of, there's a similar set of themes that are accumulating in my inbox, as well as I think um, from the public, so happy to go into more detail on some of these plans. Um, and with respect to outdoor learning, why don't I start there? Can other schools still submit? Um, yes, they can. It's right now, I think our general approach has been to not necessarily review these applications and then say 14 projects are in and everyone else is out, but to treat it more as a pipeline or a queue that's clearly prioritized. So to the extent that other sites this fall want to engage, um, we will offer more opportunities for folks to submit applications and they will be probably further down in the line as a result. Um, but should there be funds available, our goal is to continue to move through as many of these projects as possible. And I also think it does kind of um, provide a runway as well as we think about our next GO bond to provide clarity around the demand and the sizing of what a future outdoor learning program could look like in the next bond. Because um, while I'm actually just based on my preliminary review of the applications, I feel that we're going to be able to make some substantive progress with $14 million across these applications. I have no doubt that there will be some that will not receive funding and we will need to think about um, future funding from the future bond to continue to do improvements. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of the decision-making criteria, um, there were four uh, uh, outcomes um, that we workshopped with the public um, that we could use to help evaluate the respective, um, uh, I think, time, again, priority of the different applications. And those four criteria, let's see if I can remember them off the top of my head in the correct order. Um, and so you feel free to jump in and remind me. Um, but they included equity was at the top, providing equitable access to um, green greenery and um, improved schoolyards. Um, the second had to do with just increasing exposure for the students at that site to outdoor outdoors during the day. So how much does this project manage to generate a substantive increase in either the number of students or student hours exposed to the outdoors? Um, the third had to do with quality of opens the, the schoolyards and the, or I should say schoolyard spaces with a real focus on safety. So to the extent that there were actual potential physical hazards at a site, or in some cases, just things like unbearable heat as a result of lack of shade, like how can we improve health and safety outcomes at the schoolyards through physical improvements? And then lastly was climate change and just general environmental and sustainability outcomes. So um, the, that was very clear, both from the workshop participants who we did the live workshop with, and then also when we did our asynchronous workshop, the results were clearly um, consistent, actually, that those are the four priorities in that order that we should evaluate and think about application. So um, we have just begun to sift through them, um, and <coughs> we are happy to provide a report back in August. Uh, to the board about the the results, uh, so to speak. Um, and, and so part of the core concern around how to distribute equitably, that is part of our analysis. And again, our top criteria as we think about these investments, 
Um, and in terms of projects, um, all our projects, again, they will, depending on the extent to which these end up being formal capital projects, or in some cases more like furniture fixtures and equipment. So you're really more just kind of installing equipment rather than doing a huge capital project. Each of those has different procurement processes that we will be following um, consistent with the law and SFUSD policy. Uh, the, the last question was a question for clarification around low bidder turnout. Um, low bidder turnout means that when you put a project out to bid, um, in general, the more competition you have, the better prices you get, right? So in cases where only one person or one firm wants the job, um, you tend to see higher costs than what you were expecting and may have estimated. So that is the relationship between low bidder turnout and um, cost overruns, or I should say cost increases, that in those instances where we have only one or two bidders, um, we definitely overall in the industry, you will see a higher um, price than, for example, a project which has six or seven bidders. That makes sense. Yes. Um, our Spanish interpreters here. Can she um, translate the number? Thank you. Tell, tell the number. Thank you. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, los que el Distrito Unificado Escolar de San Francisco ofrece interpretación gratuita en español. Si ustedes quieren escuchar la reunión de hoy en español, por favor llamen el siguiente número: uno. 319-382-9676, luego usen la clave 665-996-976, tecla numeral, para poder acceder al español y recuerden de silenciar sus micrófonos. Gracias. Thank you. Um, yeah, it makes sense. If there's only one bidder, they, they'll have a little bit of more. Uh, leeway what they can charge, I guess. Um, so on slide 11, I like that you have the map, the pin map of how the schools are dispersed. It looks fairly well dispersed throughout the district. Um, it looks like the west west side has fewer. Um, so I don't know if that's that caught your eye. Is that the capital condition assessment map? Slide 11. No, it's the schoolyard uh, slide 11. Oh yeah, this is our application pool. Yeah. Yep. It look. Yes. I have noticed. <laughs> so okay. Well, that'll be interesting to see if, if mm -hmm. there's some late bidders that come from that area, mm -hmm. the, the Sunset and Richmond. Um, and then slide thirteen, you talked about Havard moving to Carver. I, yeah. I, I um, recollect that being discussed. And what is going to become of Havard? Um, Commissioner, so the Leola Havert Early Education, as I believe we provided in a Board of Education update, there have been window failures on parts of that building. And so after a conversation with the early education site, we could either invest money into that site, making it safe, but maybe not comfortable, or save, spend equivalent investment or slightly more um, at Carver and get an actually really viable site with a nice playground, access to a nice playground, sufficient spaces, be able to open the windows. Um, and so that was a collaborative decision made between um, cohort three, the early education program and the facilities division. So um, with full support from the Carver principal and we really appreciate her support and leadership. Um, so we're moving forward with that plan. For Leola Havard, there will be a number, not the entirety of the building is not deteriorating at the same rate. And so there actually is a wing um, which houses uh, the after school program OST in Shoestrings, which has actually had some prior investments in it and is holding. So those tenants will remain. Um, there are also a few other administrative or office tenants uh, associated with the special education program and a few other uh, random offices. And we're looking for ways to either keep them at the site or potentially relocate them. Um, and I think the question uh, that has come up as a result is it, it seems now time to talk about Leola Havard and what a modernization project should look like there. You'll actually see tomorrow night at the full board a design contract with the architecture firm WRNS to help us begin thinking through that project feasibility and assessment. 
analysis and that we would kick that off this summer and working with our new superintendent as well as again um, instructional leadership begin to talk about what our vision is for that particular site and what we'd like to accomplish there have we have ever discussed it for um, educator housing I don't believe Leola Havard has been on the list of sites for um, potentially listed as a surplus for educator housing because it's had in consistent administrative uses uh, since it was converted from an elementary school. Okay. I want to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, I know that there's a Malcolm X, there's a site near Malcolm X that's vacant. That's right. That, I, that we're looking at. Um, and then my last question is about. Uh, on slide 36 that you had mentioned around George Washington and the Lienthal, mm -hmm. the, the change orders, mm -hmm. and they're both over 20%. Um, can you talk a little bit about change orders in general, like what's normative for a school district or public agencies when they have change orders over time? And then can you discuss those particular sites? Yeah, so um, I would actually have to do more research from other school districts to be able to talk about your question of normative. Um, there is the public contracting code does provide kind of a guideline in this way of of 10% and really establishes additional threshold for approvals above 10%, which is why when those two things do come before the board, there is explanatory language about unforeseen conditions. Um, the 2016 projects that had intensive construction during COVID, I would say are um, at a, like just a significant disadvantage cost-wise from other typical projects. And those, um, both George Washington and Claire Lilienthal um, experienced unforeseen conditions, um, things that we just didn't know that pertained to the project that were outside of COVID and then significant supply chain delays and therefore increased costs due to COVID. Um, on George Washington uh, in particular, George Washington is for mostly is a seismic uh, upgrade project to the academic building. Um, the seismic project, uh, when we open the walls, uh, which the walls, you know, are unexposed until you open them, there was a significant electrical improvement that needed to happen. Once we got into that, uh, PG&E required us to do a service upgrade, uh, and then um, when pg and &E required us to do the service upgrade, they also required us to trench from a substation that was more than a mile away from the school. Um, and those trenching, trenching costs were uh, very significant. Um, even though there was a substation closer than that, I'll just say that. There was also uh, the district um, had gone into that project thinking that we would um, do an owner controlled insurance and then um, as the project proceeded and COVID became a factor um, the district's legal team we transitioned back to a contractor covered insurance policy which came at um, that in itself was three was a 1.3 percent change order back to the project um, the district paid um, and then um, just ongoing with the seismic uh, work that was done every time we opened a wall, there were other new things, and those um, were nine and a half percent in in themselves. Just all the things we've encountered when the wall was opened. Um, so Lilienthal is a little different. Lilienthal, when we went into that building, um, it turned out that the building itself wasn't attached in some places to the foundation. Uh, which was obvious work we had to take care of that we didn't know about, um, but wouldn't you couldn't can't see it unless you remove once you start removing some of the floor, then you can see the foundation, and that's when um, that was uncovered. Um, there were also um, DSA requirements when we went through permitting there um, related to testing um, that we didn't hadn't budgeted for that then um we had to pay at the back end um and yeah i think that's it i think the, the biggest one was the the subsurface conditions that we didn't know about
I wanted to ask a question about the facilities assessment and really just to kind of get a gauge on like what is the difference between a school that is like a 30 or a 31 and a school that is like a 55? Um, that's a great question, Commissioner, and I think we can but difficult to generalize. Mm -hmm. What I would say in general that indicates is that a site that has like a score of 50% tends to have more big ticket items that need to be addressed there. So um, for example, major structural issues that need to be addressed oftentimes contribute to that higher score. Um, the score is a ratio of the cost of, um, and I'm generalizing a bit, but the cost of repairing that system or that site versus replacing it outright new um, and um, and not new and upgraded necessarily, but replacing it as it is uh, new. And so when you get a higher score, that means you have more items that are failing and also tends to mean you have items that are, when you have a higher score, more expensive that are uh, failing or at risk of um, failure sometime in you know, a determined time period. So <clears throat> for me, you can often, um, we have, as these re <laughs> reports have been coming back, been kind of playing our own uh, guess, you know, guess the score of this building to do our gut check of like how we experience a building and um, how it feels as well as what we know uh, anecdotally or based on prior assessments of the site versus um, how it's tracking to the score. And so if you look at, for example, BVHM is above 40%, Malcolm X is, I believe, in the low 50s. Um, and that certainly tracks with our experience and kind of understanding of the prior level of investment that's been made in those sites. Um, most notably, you can see one extraordinary outlier of the John McLaren main building. Um, that's not the early education building, which actually is a lovely and you know, re relatively new building, but the main building, uh, which has a very high score, <laughs> um, suggesting that you know a, a more dramatic intervention would be needed there as we plan for the eventual modernization and repair of that site. Thank you for that clarity. I think that is a little bit confusing in mm -hmm. so much that it kind of represents kind of our internal measures of how much it would cost to kind of bring these facilities kind of fully up to where we want them to be more or less versus us kind of ranking phys facility con conditions and kind of giving them kind of like a score type dynamic, which I think is maybe problematic in a lot of ways. But I guess the thing that I'm wondering is, how does this like, how do you incorporate the way that staff and families feel about their school sites and kind of like the operational aspects of it? Kind of thinking mm -hmm. that if Buena Vista Horseman is a 40 and they came here and they were very upset about their 40 mm -hmm. and there's a lot of schools that are above that, kind of mm -hmm. how do we balance that and like, yeah. how are we considering those things? Yeah, Commissioner, it's a great question. And um, in August, when we've completed our assessment, we intend to come back and do a much more detailed presentation to you of the findings and what it means. We actually do both. So you get this kind of ratio, the, the cost, um, the ratio of the repair to replacement means that, of course, the higher the cost of repairing an item, the closer it gets to the cost of replacing it outright. You're actually indicating the fact that that asset is in bad shape. So regardless of the total dollar values, by converting it to a ratio, you are getting a good sense of how close to the end of its useful life is this particular asset. Now, what we are able to do and are working on, but we'll present at a future meeting, is not just the property as a whole, but the subsystem. So you'll be able to see trends across the district. For example, right now, we have early trends of just showing that our mechanical systems are more outdated and in um, more poor shape than, for example, um, the, um, you know, classroom exteriors and exteriors of our buildings. So you'll be able to compare that 
and be able to see those differences within each property um, and also across the district see certain themes emerging around what kinds of systems might need investment. We also, as part of the analysis, the consultants themselves provide a clear timeline framework that says this item should be replaced immediately because it really needs to be replaced, or you can replace it in a more natural cycle, um, replacement cycle. And so um, we're also able to sort that data in that way, and that gives us also a more clear indication of the actual condition of the facility. To your point, though, you can have a building that is in um, pretty decent shape structurally, but extremely run down cosmetically. Um, and that won't show up in this score. So you can have a building that structurally is in good shape, but where the paint is peeling, there's graffiti, maybe your playground surfacing is wonky and warped. Um, and all of those items will show up as lower price tags and may not, um, even though they might really impact user comfort and experience and perception of the site, don't track to a building failure, right? A building that needs to be totally renovated. And that's why I think it's important that we are setting aside this fall to really take these results and workshop them with you as well as with the community to get feedback on how do these results kind of track to your experience and what kinds of of investments that may not be big ticket items or big life safety items, but really impact your quality of life, please give us feedback on that. And so, for example, within the context of BVHM, quite specifically, um, the window shades, right? And just the ability to control light coming into the classroom, which is something I know is across the district or many, many sites. That is a small dollar item that has big impacts to people's quality of life. And so we want to get that kind of feedback from folks qualitatively. And then we intend to wrap that together in a capital plan that we would bring to the board for review, discussion, and eventual adoption that talks about what our priorities should be as we think about the next bond, um, as well as our other funding streams, limited funding streams for capital funding, how do we want to apply them and invest? No, thank you for that, and I appreciate your answer. I, I think for me, one thing that's missing from the presentation, maybe it's something that can come in the future, is better understanding around the how you're making your decisions and how you're evaluating kind of the outcomes of what's happening. Like everything that you shared here has been very helpful and enlightening, but I think having a clear idea of how kind of you collectively do that kind of at the beginning of your process through your process and just kind of having a space for the public to get that information and to find out because i feel compelled when i see the amount of powerpoint slides you've given me the need to like dive in and ask you specific questions about specific things which maybe isn't super helpful all the way but i do want to kind of understand how we're gauging these things how we're centering equity how we're dealing with the fact that our district isn't equitable to start as we kind of embark on these endeavors and projects. And I think maybe to highlight that, I think about the schoolyard project and kind of like everything that's happening there. And just knowing that some schools have huge yards, which create huge opportunities and other schools have hardly any yards and mm -hmm. have very limited opportunities. And like, how do we balance that? Mm -hmm. And like, what does it mean for us to both kind of prioritize giving the best that is possible at each school with the fact that all of our school sites and facilities aren't equal in um, the number of students and the size of the facility and the amount of open space that they have. So I think knowing how you're wrestling with that, I think will help us and help the community to have, I think, more trust in what you're doing and kind of to understand how you're going to handle these things when they do come up in the future. Um, and so I think that's just one additional thing um, that I would add. Um, and I think those are all of uh, my questions. Thank you. The one he was just talking. Um, I was just noticing that there are a number of schools not on this index. And is that because we just haven't reached out to those schools yet? Yeah, we're doing this work throughout the summer. So we have not finished our assessments yet. This is a sneak preview. Um, essentially of like a snapshot of the data we've collected so far. Um, that's why I think when we come back in August, you will be getting a full report of all the data with a lot more detail. <laughs> 
and um, we'll be talking together about how we want to actually, because I do think this is a we, a collaborative project, like how do we want to translate our values and um, um, guardrails, right, around the capital plan into specific direction for staff. And so we look forward to having that conversation with you and with um, stakeholders. And, and as far as I can tell, there are no charter schools on this list. Um, that are, is correct. Do we have obligations to the charter schools in, in terms of this kind of facilities con conditions index? Um, we do not have obligations to complete um, the, include them in the assessment. We do, based off of our specific MOUs with charter schools, have obligations around the maintenance and upkeep of those facilities. Is it in our best interest, though, to make sure that they're that those buildings are in good condition? It or, is, or at it, least up into the, the good condition category? Um, it is in our interest to make sure that charter schools are in equivalent condition to SFUSD schools. Right, okay. So they are on our plan to assess as well? Commissioners, it's complicated because some sites are co-located with us and some sites are not. So let me get back to you on that particular issue. We are not assessing sites that are tenant occupied. So um, for example, uh, Richmond Community Center, uh, which is located in a building in the outer Richmond, we're not assessing that particular site. We're focusing right now on just um, school sites and administrative sites. I notice on page 16 you list 153 total sites, but I think we actually own more property than that, don't we? No, it's around, it, depending how you count it, 153 to 155. But not including charter schools, that number. Um, so I just got a helpful text, charter schools are included um, in the assessment, so. Okay, so 153, 155 is everything that SFUSD owns. Yes. Okay, that's Got correct. It. Okay, great. Thank you, Commissioners. You asked a lot of questions I had, but I have more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, I'll just go through them. Uh, on page five, that's, is that the last of the 2016 bond projects? And that whole schedule um, on page four. Those are just representative of the ones that are currently under construction. So all of the rest of the projects that we're discussing are also 2016 bond funds, including like the reallocation is also 2016 bond funds. These are just active construction projects. But we have no other, um, I'm not talking about the reallocated funds, but the rest of the funds, this is it, right? These are our outstanding modernization projects. So in the, yes, basically. So we've got Mission Bay and BVHM, outdoor learning, site security, PAC, the things that were captured in the reallocation, those projects are not in this uh, schedule. Let me see, right, just checking. Um, so this reflects kind of the projects that are being finished up out of the 2016 bond modernization program. And then we're out of money with that bond. That is correct. Once we spend the 100 million that was reallocated in October. Right. Great. Now back to page 11, the green schoolyards. Um, there, there was out of the 2016 bond a whole section on green schoolyards. I forgot the number. Um, so, and this 14 million is on top of that, right? So does that mean the previous sum was already all done? Mostly, Commissioner, there are some funds left there which we will we can leverage towards this um, activity. Um, there was only, I believe, five million dollars in total for a green schoolyard program in the 2016 bond. Um, so it was a small amount, and most of those funds have been expended. Um, but as we identify and go through these applications, to the extent that folks are indicating in their application they want their green schoolyard refreshed, um, I think we can, you know utilize and leverage those funds as well. And who will be doing the actual review of these uh, applications? Um, we're discussing that right now, but it'll be uh, hopefully a blended team of SFUSD facilities division staff, as well as um, other divisions um, within SFUSD. So whoever was doing those green schoolyard program, is that a 
a department or a group of yeah, people? Yeah, the Green School Arts Program is under Facilities Division. So Tamar Barlev, who's our Green School Arts Coordinator, is playing an active role in helping us review and organize these applications. Okay. And to um, Commissioner Boja's question of um, the criteria, I pulled up your previous presentation. Mm -hmm. There are four, equity, exposure, mm -hmm. quality, and climate. Mm -hmm. right? um, even though these are the four areas, I think what Commissioner Voges was asking is, within these four areas, what are the actual, like, how are you going to make decisions with these four? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're trying to, in the application itself, which I think is helpful for commissioners to see, so you can see kind of the way we're, we're going with this, we actually ask each of the principals to fill out a little worksheet calculating the number of um, student exposure hours that would result from the project, for example. We're also asking principals to speak to the extent to which the project um, is equity minded and improves access to um, low income students and students without um, access to you know, open space. Um, and we also have uh, as a district our own kind of metrics that we can layer on, for example, percentage of the student body that receives subsidized lunch. Um, and also we're looking at student enrollment numbers and the size of the schoolyard, right? So we have a whole series of metrics that we will line up um, side by side. And uh, again, our goal is to be transparent. So once we are able to look at all of these um, metrics side by side and rank the 66 applications, we'll be able to share that both with the board and the um, full public. So folks have an opportunity to provide feedback if they see any kind of patterns that are not useful or again counter to uh, what we're trying to accomplish as a district. Great, yes, once you do uh, kind of quantify these four uh, area metrics, it would be very helpful to list out the how you quantify them and then the actual result and then provide a list so that people can see and um, at least we're being transparent even if they don't agree. Right, so I think that's absolutely a, a good point. And um, and then last question on this slide is, you're looking to hire a new person to oversee this. What happened to Tamara and her team of um, schoolyard people? Tamara is not a bond program manager, so her role is more around technical assistance and coordination with school sites, and also education about. Um, professional development and education and coaching to school sites about how to get green schoolyards up and running, how to manage volunteers, troubleshooting, those kinds of issues. Um, we don't have a bond um, project manager right now because we are finishing the rest of these modernization projects um, who can focus on delivering just the projects from um, the outdoor learning program. So we do need to hire someone and hopefully we will even get ourselves a landscape architect by background. So you can't use the people who oversaw the green schoolyard? We cannot. Program. They don't have the, um, they have a very valuable but different skill set than what's needed to deliver the capital projects. I see. Okay. Thank you. And then page 12 was the site security. Thank you for including that. Um, I understand the sensitivity of publishing specific safety data. Um, so thank you for including this. My question here is um, the anticipated start of construction will be the start of school year. Which one can, students are back? That's a little uh, troublesome. And how long do you think it would take to implement all the locks? Um, Luckily, we are talking about a relatively small number of sites, given our overall portfolio. The vast majority of SFUSD school sites have Columbine locks installed already, or Columbine lock equivalent <laughs> um, locking mechanisms. And so um, I have set for my team uh, a goal of completing the remaining installations in the next school year. Um, the locks themselves, luckily, this is work that is relatively contained and can be done on weekends and in evenings. So um, the biggest thing we're going through right now is our procurement process. So we are starting this summer, we're going to focus on getting architects 
um, organized from our bond pool um, to go out and look at the remaining sites, develop a scope of work and design. Um, in some cases, it's as simple as just replacing a locking mechanism, but there are some instances where we have to replace not only the door, but the door frame. And that's when you get kind of more complicated projects that might take a little longer. So our goal is to have our design teams kind of sort the remaining projects into that category of like, how, which of these fit into easy, which of these are a little bit harder, prioritize the easy ones and uh, move forward as quickly as possible. I'm glad to hear that not, uh, that most or many of our schools already have these locks. Do you have an idea of what 20%, 50%, 80% already have? I'm going to uh definitely over 80 percent maybe close to 90 percent oh all right yeah that was better than I thought. yeah i think if, <laughs> if we include that it would yeah. make the public feel better yeah <laughs> <Okay>. yeah <laughs> um and then for the remaining if we could track to say okay of the total 100 percent of the schools were already 90 percent then yeah, Maybe Commissioner, yes. as we uh, vet and develop the projects, each one of them will come to the board as a contract. And so you will see them and we will discuss them at that time as this site, here's the project to finish their Columbine locks. No, I was just saying that for updates like this in the future, if we can have a whole, a bigger picture, right? All okay. of the schools, 90% already have them. Here's yep. the 10% we're working on. And a month later, we already made you know 1% progress, 2% yeah. until at the end of the school year, we want to finish them all, that kind of progress. I will try to think of ways that I can be both provide more reassuring detail with while remaining <laughs> sufficiently vague for security. I understand. I understand. Thank you for yeah. being sensitive to that. That's great. Thank you. And then um, page 13, the Southeast Facility Improvement Plan. What is our goal? Meaning, is it um, figure out which facilities we need to modernize? Is it to maybe move some more, like this one that's moving or consolidating? What What is our overall um, plan? Com Commissioner, when I spoke to the board in October 2021 about the need for this uh, reallocation, there were a couple of different factors which were at play. Um, one is we are making a huge investment in Mission Bay. <laughs> Um, an over $100 million investment in creating the new school at Mission Bay. And when we passed the 2016 bond, um, we discussed with voters and also with the board leadership and stakeholders that we there was a placeholder for a new school in the Bayview. But as we speak with our instructional colleagues in the Southeast and particularly cohort three, there is no need right now for a, an, a true like additional buying new property and building a brand new school because we have sites like Leola Havard and John McLaren that are currently underutilized for instructional purposes. And we also have a number of other schools that are um, existing and in need of renovation. Um, so the purpose of this is keeping equity at the center. My commitment to Southeast leadership is to say, we're going to make a commensurate investment in Southeast facilities that we're making and creating a new Mission Bay. And so if you think about how to spend $115 million amongst the Southeast facilities, what should be our priorities? What do we want to tackle first? And in particular, the second thing then driving the need for a Southeast facilities plan is contemplated um, changes to the student assignment policy. When you look at SFUSD's overall enrollment patterns, um, notwithstanding the current statewide, you know, hopefully temporary decline in enrollment, you look at the longer term patterns, which we discussed in detail at Mission, our Mission Bay hearing, and all you see is growth, particularly in the Southeast. And when you think of the fact that 50% of SFUSD students come from four zip codes currently in the Southeast, if we want to create a student assignment policy that again prioritizes geographic proximity to one's you know origin home point of origin where you where you leave for school every morning then actually we need more space in the southeast over the long term that um, should you reverse the daily outward migration of southeast students or even slight not reverse in full um, but um, reverse in part or shift uh, the daily uh, school, <coughs> sorry, student assignment patterns. 
um, we do need to contemplate where and how those students can go to school in the southeast. And I want to make sure personally that we are providing facilities that are as attractive and compelling as the facilities that exist elsewhere in our system. And so those were the two kind of real main um, rationales for me in coming forward to the board and asking for this reallocation of funds. We have, I have been mostly working um, very closely with our cohort three uh, leadership, uh, Assistant Superintendent Demetrius Rice Mitchell. Um, this is also connected to charter school conversations and obligations that we have. Um, and so have involved that office as well, and also our early education um, program who plays a, a strategic role, I think, in thinking about the growth of enrollment, particularly across the district, particularly in the Southeast. Um, we hope to bring our new superintendent up to speed <laughs> and get his feedback um, prior to engaging more broadly with district leadership um, and site leaders as well as the public, um, but have done a lot of preliminary thinking and in particular with the Leola Havard challenges we've experienced over the past few months, that's been a real impetus for us to um, dig deep on the Leola Havard early ed and, and think about the ways that that program, even being relocated to Carver could be a help um, to Carver long term. So this $20 million, are we engaging some farm to help us do this? Are we? We did. We have WRNS Architects um, has been providing some support to us. And also the data we're collecting from the capital condition assessments will also be a valuable tool um, to help us uh, engage with the public in a thoughtful way that includes quantitative and qualitative data um, and, and get their feedback on various visions that we can accomplish at the site. And that plan should be done, did you say October? Um, I actually, I think that is largely dependent on the scope of what we try to address and dependent on feedback from the superintendent. So, um, but the Leola Havard move, that's happening this fall. The Leola Havard early education is moving to Carver this fall. Great, thank you. Um, air cleaners, it's the next page, portable air cleaners. Um, what's the expected lifespan of the portable air cleaners that we already installed last year, earlier part of this calendar year? Five to ten years, uh, five years. Okay, so then do we have a replacement plan and budget and? Not yet. <laughs> we, we just bought them. <laughs> We've got four more years of life in them. And at that point, actually, the models that we have, we can make a choice about rather just whether or not to spend the money replacing the filters, which at that point may, once you include labor and everything else, be the same as just buying a whole new set. So um, we'll see. Um, but we have done that math to look at what the replacement costs will be, how many units we have, and um, you know, we will be making um, in the current in the current budget. We have requested funds to um, allow for the filter replacements in the coming year, and I believe that request has been funded. Great, I'm glad to hear that. And I you know we've discussed offline about um, the state health recommendation of how many air changes per hour, and having um, just to bring up the commissioners to speed. I think the ones that we have will get one to two or three. Our calculations changes. show more like two and a half to three and a half changes per hour, depending on the size of the classroom. And then with windows open, mm -hmm. which is the current COVID guidance, you right. get to four, um, four to five changes. So um, it's a you know, joint strategy, the portable air cleaner plus the fresh air coming from the outside. Right. Now, when you switch from trying to manage COVID to managing wildfire smoke, That's... you have a separate set of dilemmas. Right. Um, and, you know, I think um, <clears throat> the current classroom portable air cleaners, so the large ones that, uh, again, can accomplish between two and a half to three and a half uh, air changes on their own, um, those are also their HEPA filtration, so they're the highest level, and also have like another layer of filtration that is meant to really help with 
um, the, the odor and kind of gases that come with wildfire smoke particulate. So they are well suited for that. Um, they will not on their own get you to four air changes an hour, but they will make a substantive and we hope noticeable difference in the air quality in classrooms uh, if and when we are hit by severe wildfires this fall. Mm -hmm. And also just to inform the commissioners that um, there are some kind of do-it-yourself do it air yeah. purifiers that um, a number of schools along with their PTAs have done themselves. Do we have any sort of guidance stance either way on those efforts? Only that we cannot maintain or track the condition and quality of those air cleaners or the extent to which they are um, properly assembled and making the intended benefit. What I would say is when we're talking about do-it-yourself um, fans where you basically have taken a, let's say a 20 by 20 box fan and attached either one or multiple um, you know, box filters to the external, those cannot and should not be plugged in long term, certainly not overnight. They must right. be supervised at all times. Um, again, we encourage folks to use the air cleaners we're providing. We are also researching um, the extent to which we can pro provide potentially additional support um, during wildfire season, um, but uh, we will not maintain or track and don't have the resources to supervise the use of do-it-yourself units. Got it. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I have lots of questions. <laughs> um, page 16, the con condition assessment mm -hmm. plan, the $1.8 million that came out of, that is coming out of the bond funds or? Yes. Okay. And what is room-based, not room-based? Data is aggregated yeah. on site, not room-based. What does that mean? Um, meaning that we are not comprehensively reviewing the condition of each single classroom as we develop our condition assessment. There is a sample done of classroom conditions. Um, and yeah, so sampling. that's what it means. Yeah. Sampling. Yes, yeah, because it doesn't, you're just counting like ceiling tiles and like light fixtures at that point if you're doing most of again what's driving the building's condition are system-wide issues got it thank you no that's a good uh, good approach um very uh sensible engineering approach uh almost to the end page um 28 about the spawn site updates on program website improvements. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to see that. I have one question, though. I couldn't find the link from our homepage. I mean, if I type in yeah. sfusd.bond, <laughs> I get there. But if I'm just on sfusd.com, I can't get there. I can't. I don't know where it is. We're getting there. We're right now we're working on um, like just built pulling together our website and then we do have to talk with our comms office and other folks about how to connect back to the main website so that there is a um, kind of clear way to navigate your way to our site you can accomplish it finding under search but you're correct from there's right. no from the launch page it's not there so but the plan is to yes. make it visible somewhere yes. right yeah we wanted to kind of finish our content first and then we'll link it back to the website so this when is do still you in progress that to be turning it live or putting it onto a navigation somewhere like in the next couple months or is it five six months down the road yeah in the next couple of months i think our target to complete the website including like putting in the content from 2011 and 20 and 2006 is end of December but I mean yes there we are in an ongoing conversation about how this should link okay great. I'll say if you looked in a particular place and there's a place that makes sense to you I'm open to recommendation okay I'll take a look and recommend because I'm looking at it everywhere I'm like I don't see anywhere that I can get there um, I did notice that uh, it links to the CBOX site and I would recommend that once it's live to link back from CBOC to the bond site, because right now the CBOC site doesn't go anywhere. 
So, but I'll give you some suggestions if I find a, a logical place for it to be. And um, oh, last question on this is 37, the bond program change order breakdown. Thank you very much for this. I really uh, like this. My question is that 9% and a 12% that are clearly errors, architect and engineering errors and omissions. Can we get our money back? <laughs> or parts of our money back and if it was their error? Errors and omissions, I think, are, or in, unfortunately insurance? for these projects, are, I think, uh, a tough pill to swallow, but part of it. And I think, at least right now, what we're embarking upon, both for capital planning, um, the capital plan process, and also for bond planning, is doing this for all of the 2016 and hopefully all of the 2011 projects and seeing if there's a trend across projects. If it's a trend across design teams, um, if there's something that we can learn about the performance, both internally and also from our partners, and if we start seeing, you know, big percentages from the same team recurring across mm -hmm. several projects, then I think, sort of along the lines with what you're suggesting, there's a conversation to have, or maybe um, a different way for us to look at our architect pool in the next phase. Um, Right now, I think this is really about information collecting and trying to diagnose um, potential like performance improvement opportunities. Exactly, in the this is program. great, I love it. Maybe this question is to our legal team of whether we can build something that once you see some trend, because I'm just looking at the numbers, 9% plus 12%, let's say it's 20%, 20% of roughly $2 million is $400,000 is not insignificant. So if there's any way that we can recover, I don't know, 50% of $400,000, that's $200,000, we could, a lot of window shades at BVHM, right? Yeah. Um, Commissioner, I would just speak to, um, I, one, really welcome your support in wanting to tackle those issues. And I think um, what I would also say is that um, as we think about how to prioritize instances where errors and omissions have been a huge driver of change orders, um, my general priority is to focus on those where there are actual health and safety issues that were not addressed successfully, um, because we do a lot of construction management is a balancing act at any time you're you're thinking about the relationship you have with the contractor or the designer over the course of the project and the goals that you have overall for the project. Um, so it is natural. Um, it is, as um, Ms. Aberry said, it is just like unforeseen site conditions mm -hmm. that as you're doing a project stuff, you know, doesn't turn out the way you thought it would or some there's a miscommunication. Um, but what we, I think, as a district do need to take seriously, and that's why I really applaud um, Ms. Aberry and the bond team for going deep into this analysis is um, prioritizing places where there may have been um, health and safety errors that are worth really noting. And as we go forward with our bond work, thinking about having a proactive strategy for enforcement around those kinds of errors. And, and I think I applaud that definitely. Thank you for starting this work. Like I said, I love this <laughs> slide of just approaching it. I, I want to hold contractors and hold ourselves, all employees to high standards and just putting them on notice that yes, mistakes, everybody makes mistakes, but pay attention and try to reduce those. If there's any sort of language that we can put in the contract, at least to put it in the back of their mind that says, hey, you know, <laughs> that uh, one mistake, fine, two mistakes, three mistakes, uh, you're gonna have to pay for your mistakes. And we're, you know, we're responsible for spending public money. So we should hold people to high standards. Construction, <laughs> engineering, architects, students, everybody should be held to high standards. So that's my, maybe something can be done. Yes. I think in that same vein, I think figuring out from you, like what is actually like the cost it would take to like staff up enough to kind of minimize some of these things or other structural things that are possible if anything are i think trying to figure out like you said what is the balance between cost execution what's expected mm -hmm. what's not 
Commissioners, I will say that the category that I think um, Ms. Berry and I are united in focusing on is actually the owner requested. That's where I would say you should really, that's a place where we can make changes that speaks to the fact that our scoping process and approach to scoping the project. We hold ourselves to high standards. Right. And yes. so, and also, as you know, in this particular example, in terms of bang for a buck, it's really around scope changes that you know, basically decisions that were delayed or made later in the project, um, how many of those decisions could have made, been made earlier or in a more informed way? And then, you know, what are our opportunities to tackle unforeseen site conditions? Those are, in some respects, by their very nature, um, limited, but are there ways that we can engage at sites that we contemplate being high risk, you know, in more destructive testing? And, um, and thinking about what the trends are and changes that we see in even in unforeseen site conditions. If you see truly variable site conditions, you're like, actually, we're doing a pretty good job given <laughs> if all of <laughs> there's no pattern. Um, I felt good at Rec Park. I was like, well, that time the stream moved. The other time <laughs> there's an underground stream that moved. This time, you know, uh, there was no way to tell until you peeled back the, the building, right? So when you see really variable unforeseen site conditions, you're like, oh, we're using it the right way. That's what that category is for. But I really want to focus, particularly as we think about the next bond, and this is why the facilities condition assessment is so useful, and thinking about scope, right? And as we scope the project, um, I think uh, there is sometimes pressure to make your project seem smaller and to try and get by with being, you think you're being efficient early on, but you end up paying for it later. And, and as we get to the Buena Vista Horace Mann project, we're going to be having some of that conversation with you about um, what is the right project to do here that will serve students and the community for another 50 to 80 years. Right? How do we how do we do a project that leaves people feeling good about the project? Right. Thank you. Yes, my comment about uh, holding people to high standards that thirty eight percent or forty one percent is we need to hold ourselves to higher standards of doing a better scoping job and management of unforeseen circumstances. Job great. Thank you. Uh, I'm done with this presentation. We'll ask question about your comment with the custodial service. Did you say that we're at 20% staffing level? 20% um, vacancies. Vacancies, okay, so we're 80% staffing level. Yeah, that's, okay. that's hard. We've been running at 10% the whole year. That was hard enough. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when you're at a place of 80% staffing, but you still have all the same work that gets to done, needs to be done, that also then just, kind of fuels the wave of retirements and resignations as people can make choices to workplaces with less workload and higher compensation. And so we do really need to tackle this as a district at a system Is level. Is there an option for outsourcing some of this work? Um, there is. We do right now, um, for example, at the end of summer construction for bond projects and facilities design construction projects, as part of that um, capital project, we often have um, external uh, uh, cleaning companies um, come in to do a white glove service of the site because we are using our existing custodians to deal with normal work and cleaning up after a, a construction site is its own thing, right? So, so we do use those resources for those kinds of projects. This year we are, um, we are talking with our labor partners about um, providing and bringing in additional contract services, provided that we give staff, of course, first. Um, first, if, if if staff always get first op opportunities to get overtime, and to get the work assigned to them, but right now no one wants to do it. Right, we're really people are exhausted. Our labor agreements have some sort of limitations, but we are able to. Yes, we are able to do it. We just want to be collaborative and fair to our own staff. Great. Those are all my questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Great. All right. Second item. BVHM project update. Great. Commissioners, um, in October, when we reallocated the 2016 bond funds and set aside $40 million for Buena Vista Horace Mann, we promised we would come back before the end of the school year 
to give an update on the design of the project and particularly to provide early indications about the scope and size of that project and would you know, $40 million from the 2016 bond be sufficient? Would there need to be combined between the current bond funds and future bond funds? Um, what would that strategy, uh, would that strategy be necessary? What might it look like? And so this is that report um, to the B&G committee. Um, and uh, we, I really want to complicate, compliment Ms. Aberry and her team for working very closely with site leaders uh, since January to uh, develop these proposals and um, to complete this work. Thank you. Hello again, commissioners. Um, you can skip through. Don covered the, some of the information in the early slides, so we'll just do a little slow walk here. Um, go ahead to the next one, the why are we here? This is the section that Don just walked through. So you can skip to slide six, which is project startup. Um, okay, and then set slide seven. This is sort of a generic and specific slide. This is an introduction to what it takes to start up a project and then the corresponding um, dates that we did that for the BVHM project. Um, we start by just doing a kind of data dump of all the existing documents, any prior projects, any um, structural analyses of reports, work orders, and all the different things that have already happened in the district, um, as well as kind of a historic uh, data gathering from outside the district. And then we start to put together the project team. So the first thing we did was assign a district PM. Um, then our, our in-house consultants in AECOM assign a PPDM design manager, um, and then we select a design team. So for this project, we selected Meek Knoll and Tam Architects, uh, and that came before the board in March uh, of this year. Um, we then uh, selected a community outreach consultant, which um, is a new uh, piece that um, the bond program is uh, trying on for this project. Um, because of the request by the BVHM community to be really intensive and intentional about how we collected feedback from um, the school community. So we brought that before the board in April, along with a hazmat consultant, which is standard practice um, to do a, a hazmat analysis of the existing site. We then um, also brought, brought the survey contract um, to the board in April, and the geotech consultant come, will be on uh, tomorrow night's calendar. I'm sorry, agenda. Um, next slide, this is kind of a throwback to the prior slide where we talked about FCAs um, and the, the FCIs, the actual scores, and just a, an indication of where BVHM sits um, sort of relative to these. It is in the poor category. Uh, along with the other schools that are listed here, but there are others um, also that, like uh, along the lines of what um, Commissioner Bo just pointed out, that um, BVHM it has company in this category. I'll say. Um, so the next slide is sort of a pro is a progress diagram of all the things we've done and where we're headed. Um, and so you can see that we've been making meaningful progress on the um, project assessment phase and getting the scope, starting to understand the scope of the project in the bottom in that light yellow. We've also been doing some um, near term improvement projects to address some critical needs at the site that needed immediate attention. Um, so among those, we did uh, remove some window grills, uh, the school's request to just um, provide more connectivity between inside and outside and allow them to open the windows a bit more. Um, also just an aesthetic improvement for the courtyard at BVHM. Um, we did some electrical outlet work, some phone line work, um, and uh, did a ceiling tile um, replacement project where we went through the, all of the academic building and took out um, either the broken or missing ceiling tiles, replaced them all. Uh, we will, uh, for summer projects, we will be doing a pavement, some, a pavement improvement project, a painting project in the, in the courtyard by the garden. Uh, we'll also be installing an AC unit at the computer lab um, and doing some, um, uh, wrapping some, some hot water pipes for insulation and to hopefully cool down the space that they're in. Um, we will be back to the board um, in, in August, most likely for uh, to start to really get started on schematic design um, because 
the next phase of the contract requires board approval. So um, just a bit about stakeholder engagement. Go, please move to the next. And then the next one, thank you. So we did a series of department meetings. The district department meetings are standard practice for a modernization projects. So all of the departments that you see listed there on the left side, we met with in an intensive session to ask them, you know, the current condition at BVHM and also the needs and vision of those departments for what BVHM uh, should or could be. On the right side, the site stakeholder engagement. Some of these are typical and some of these are specific to BVHM, again, because of the level of engagement that the school site requested from the bond program um, that we, of course, agreed was really merited in this case. Um, so we did meet with all of the site users, including the after school program, the wellness program, the stayover program, which, of course, is unique to BVHM, um, the school site leadership. Um, faculty and staff, we met with students directly, we met with the PTA and the school site council, um, and many of those multiple times. So um, the next section is a summary of the engagement that we did with the community and some photos of the engagement effort. Um, we did hold in the period of April 9th to May 27th, uh, more than 25 events and activities. Uh, with direct and completely bilingual at all times outreach with the BVHM community. That did include four larger community events, um, four events with staff, and uh, direct engagement with students, and then um, and then one-to-one -one engagement at drop-off and pickup on 10 different dates. Um, we have heard at this point from over 200 members of the BVHM community um, through either passive like surveys or active like in-person um, interactions. We have also been meeting on site every week with site leadership. Of course, now that they're on summer break, so are we from those meetings, but we will re-engage in August. Um, and then we reported out to the BVHM community and staff um, in May at two different occasions. Um, to be able to do this, it did, there was a schedule impact to the project and the, the school um, requested this and um, we agreed, but it does mean that we, um, our project assessment phase was about one month longer than it would typically be. Um, the next slide has some images of the engagement and also a sort of a schedule summary of, of all of the um, engagement that we did. And what we were headed towards with this, and you can go to the next slide, is getting to a program on concept design that was um, indicative and reflective of the feedback from the BVHM community. Um, and so what we found from that conversation is summarized here. Um, this is what we keep calling the what we heard slide. Um, really uh, a desire for first to accommodate the existing program at the school. The school is already um, un has fewer classrooms than they need. I mean, is using some spaces, some more flexible spaces as classrooms that are particularly well suited for classrooms. Um, they really wanted to separate the elementary and the middle school uh, sort of location wise on the site. And they wanted more flexible and multi use spaces um, and just sort of nicer flexible and multi use spaces because they actually do have quite a they have two gyms and they have an auditorium and a, and a cafeteria, but they're all you know not quite as welcoming as I think the school would want. Um, they did request to, uh, that we look to utilize rooftops from play areas. Uh, they wanted the wellness center centrally located, um, a dedicated area for family access, community access, um, to kind of align with their with their vision as a community school. Um, so providing wraparound services for their school community uh, in a way that didn't have to walk through the school site to achieve. Um, they wanted more, uh, just a more sustainable looking and feeling school. Um, they wanted to maintain the library as a very special space in the school increase the amount of storage, um, have more connections from indoor to outdoor spaces, particularly um, dining. They really liked in co during COVID uh, eating outside and wanted to continue to do that, but have the flexibility to not do that if needed, uh, and um, better ventilation and temperature control. Um, and so the next slide is a bird's eye aerial Google, Google image of the school as it currently sits. Um, and so I don't know if, I mean, I'll just for orientation, I guess um, you, you commissioners probably are aware, but 
and perhaps there's other people watching who don't know. The larger building uh, on the top of the image is the academic, what we would call the academic building. Um, and then if I'm just sort of wrapping around the site on 23rd Street where the little red indicator is, that is the auditorium. Um, the corner there of Valencia and 23rd is um, a music, the music classroom, the art classroom, and then what's, what's referenced as the girls' gym, the smaller gym. That is where the Dolores um, stayover program is located in the evenings. Um, progressing along, you get to um, kind of a where the, the school, there's a weight room there at BVHM right now that's in that little wing. Um, and then uh, the, the middle school is in the building with the, with the pitched roof in the middle of the image. Um, and then the, the square, more square building, multi-level building towards the bottom right of the image is the larger gym. Um, and also and then it connects to kind of the, what was a large commercial kitchen and a cafeteria. Um, that's the cafeteria and sort of multi-purpose room area that is not currently in use um, by the school. Um, this is the courtyard is all of the open space that the school has and it's sort of split between this active side where the play structure and the turf field, little soccer field are um, and painted um, asphalt courts. And then on the other side is the garden. Um, where they do have a garden classroom and a small climbing structure um, there as well for for uh, younger grades. So if we go to the next image, the next image, um, we're not talking about the open space quite yet because we're at the program level, but this is where a very um, blocky, of course, uh, image of where we are um, following all of that feedback and then an intensive exercise by the design team. The academic building is proposed to be repurposed as the upper grades um, building, so swapping the lower grades and the upper grades from where they currently are on site. Probably the most transitional feature, transformative feature that's proposed is um, demolition of the existing cafeteria and replacement of that building with a new two-story building. The upper, stores, the upper story would be for part of the lower grade classrooms, which would expand the number of classrooms, uh, I believe, by three in total, um, plus a new TK classroom as well. Uh, a new multipurpose room would be constructed underneath an indoor-outdoor sort of um, transitional space aligned with the feedback we got there, attached to the kitchen, and then the floor below the larger gym, the larger gym would stay as it is, but the floor below would be this lower level community area programmed for access directly from Valencia Street to allow families seeking uh, services or potentially for weekend programming um, to access from that side, not having to travel through the school. Um, this also allows us to think about the lower grades and use of the courtyard space for uh, age appropriate play structures for TK and kinder classrooms. Um, and then the, the smaller gym would stay as is, the Dolores Shelter Stayover Program would stay in that space for as long as it's needed. Um, and um, the library would also move down a floor in the in the academic building to sort of flow into the um, courtyard space. Um, I think that that's I captured pretty much all the things are on there. Um, and I think important to note when we look at this that that this is the program of what we would consider a full project and inclusive of most of the feedback that we've heard. Um, and we can't, it, we couldn't deliver this project all at the same time. And we don't know exactly what the phasing or incrementing would be, you know, in, in, in time and in order, because we're still working towards a cost. Um, we will need the full cost estimate in order to really break that down and identify the phases. But we have, I have more to say, that's not the end. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to reflect back some feedback from this site on the next slide. We did review this concept with them and they they were very um, pleased with the concept and, and um, said to us that the plans were responsive to the site and to the community feedback. I also um, got an email from Claudia Delarios Moran, who is the uh, principal at the school today. She had been planning to come, but she was unable to for health reasons. And she said, um, 
The slide deck is a great representation of all the work that took place this past semester. I'm proud to be part of the project and look forward to seeing it fully realized. So that's her feedback to you. And then let's talk a little bit about cost now. Um, go ahead and skip to the there's that one exactly thank you so we know that the project is more cost more than 40 million dollars um and if we go back to don's comments from november i think um, that is, has been clear for several months to do a transformational project at bvhm the price tag is more than 40 million uh, and important to remember also that 40 million is a catch-all number including soft costs so when we think about construction projects we're really in a 40 million dollar allocation talking more about like a $25 million construction cost project. Um, so um, at this stage, given that we have $40 million, the project will need to be done in parts, and we will likely need a future bond to finance the remainder. Um, when we look at this schedule, this is our, the proposed schedule for, for BVHM, obviously highly simplified because we don't have the phasing worked out. Um, you can see that where the next bond would hit, um, which would be likely, again, likely prior to the commencement of construction of the project. Um, so I think it's important to just think about that we could have better certainty about availability of funds for the remainder of the project um, when that bond hits the ballot. Um, so what can we do with 40 million? I think that's really the question we set out to ask on the next slide, please. Um, we can do some pretty significant health and safety upgrades. And you know we could have divided this many different ways, but this is pretty indicative to just look at the required site upgrades that we would need to do, the site work to enable construction, um, to do an all electric HVAC system, I think we're committed to do to doing in this uh, part of the city and also because of the specific ventilation challenges that this site has to do voluntary structural seismic upgrades and even though it says voluntary they're only voluntary because they are not required by code but they are best practice um, and of course we always try to do all of the seismic upgrade work that we can do within a project and to replace the roofs I did, uh, we did include the, so the soft cost, um, you know, factor into these numbers so that you could just see the numbers broken out simply, but this is what $40 million buys you at BVHM. Um, this, do it doesn't buy new restrooms. It doesn't buy interior lighting. It doesn't buy the general modernization that is really the transformational before and after photos that you see on your own tours or in our monthly highlights. Um, it also doesn't pay for the new addition, the additional classrooms, uh, and the separation of the upper and lower grades, um, which is a priority for the school. Uh, and you can see in this notes here that it is not just the future program that requires more classrooms, it's their current program today. So um, in terms of like, okay, so what do we do from here? If you go to the next slide. Um, we are working on a comprehensive cost estimate that actually should be complete very shortly. And then we will sit and pour over that cost estimate to make sure that we agree with what the cost estimator said. Um, and then we will start talking about how to put the project into buckets. How do we phase the project? How do we um, scope the design of the project in order to make sure that we have a project we can build with 40 million and then hopefully a project we can build with the future bond um, and also we can't program money we don't have and we can't pro we assume that the voters will pass something that's not on the ballot yet so um, that's really the challenge before us for the summer and then as i said earlier we will be back uh, in front of the board for approval of phase two of the design contract to set the schematic design phase in motion, uh, likely in August. Paired with that, we will reinitiate community engagement once the school is back in session. And here's the website link. And that's it. Thank you. Do we have any public comments? Uh, slide number uh, four, 
I want to make a comment, but I also would like to uh, share Claudia. I've known Claudia for about 10 years, the principal, and she just wants to give props to uh, Lucinia and Don that they've been doing a good job, and I want to share the email she sent to me, if that's okay. She says, <clears throat> uh, I think that the slide deck is fairly representative of the work that we've done in the semester to identify the community needs and subsequently to render a design to that accounts for all of them. Uh, it is clear that this project will cost more than uh, more money initially allocated to it. That said, I, clear, I clearly recall that Don and Licinia both stating that the dollar amounts are not usually associated with projects up front and that this was only happened in the case because the board had decided how to reassign the $100 million um, last fall. In summary, I'm I'm proudly, I proudly stand by the work that the multidisciplinary uh, outreach team and architecture firm has done to envision a building whose scope reflects the structural and pedagogy uh, needs of our community. Thanks again, Claudia. So just want to put that to them. She's, she's right on and she's proud of what they've done. Uh, the reason I just wanted to point out slide uh, four is I'm confused as to why the green line around the 14 million, and then you have the 40 million, but it's all on a slide pertaining to uh, Horace Mann. I am I to read that, that there may be monies from the 14 million? I I'm just want to know why those are just highlighted on a Horace Mann thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was actually one of my questions. So do commissioners have other questions first? I just have a couple questions or just um, and thank you so much. I really appreciate the work done so far and look forward to this project being completed eventually. Um, when you talked about the, the 40 million, what 40 million can buy for this project, were you not able to cost out the other items? That work is still in progress, okay. but I'll let this. And once the major work is being done, are we considering a swing site for the school? Um, the sequencing of the work will reveal to us what kind of swing site or on-site accommodations are necessary to complete the work. So for many of our renovations, it's actually more rare to move a school entirely off-site. We oftentimes find ways to break down and sequence the work in a way that allows for some ongoing instructional activity to happen at BVHM. It's very notably constrained, um, but we don't yet have an answer on uh, like the extent to which off-site versus on-site is necessary or uh, desired at this point. Okay. We will definitely be talking about this in fall, though. We, we will have enough information at that point to be in talking about it. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, I know you don't have a estimate of the total cost yet, but um, we have a range for like how much elementary school modernization, how, how much middle school and how much high school is. So just based on that, do you have a rough idea yeah i mean that's how we came up uh, you know when i was <laughs> as we discussed this quite thoroughly in october and went back and forth as uh, staff with the board um 40 million dollars was the upper end of that kind of range of typical costs and i shared that number while at the same time um uh, relentlessly adding caveats about the fact that there were two things at play here. One is that is just a magnitude estimate based on averages and also to our earlier conversation about scoping, what kind of project we wanted to deliver at BVHM, right? Because um, we have done now a series of successful modernizations across the district that focused on um, the basics of health and safety plus some improved functionality, but that feels very different than a transformative project like um, Mission Bay, which is new construction, um, would be. Um, and I think we need to land somewhere in between 
right? That when we think about a site that is a hundred years old, like Buena Vista Horace Mann, and has had very limited investment, to go in and just address the basics of life safety does not actually seem very future oriented to me and prudent, given the fact that this is one of the schools that also has um, a very high student enrollment and, uh, and is likely to continue to have um, that enrollment and has been frankly kind of loved to death, right, over the past decade. So our recommendation to the board is that uh, while we could do a minimum kind of life safety or um, typical modernization project to take this opportunity to do more than that. And so we will, we are likely to land somewhere between the $40 million uh, that you could use to just do basic life safety and, you know, the $100 million for Mission Bay, um, which is brand new construction, brand new school top to bottom. And, and to uh, Mr. Ridgeway's question earlier, there was $7 million that was sort of uh, held on reserve. Right, is that still the plan? Um, it is, is still held in reserve. That, that, those funds were held in reserve so that should the board provide direction saying for one reason or another, just do the four, <laughs> if, if it, the, it turned out that the project was $42.5 million, that we wouldn't have to kind of go back to scratch of renegotiating the allocation to come up with those additional funds. I think at this point, our staff recommendation to the board and um, absent precise direction from the board contrary, that we're going to move forward with again, continuing to scope a bigger project and using the outdoor learning money does not get you any closer, any faster to that bigger project. So we would recommend preserving the $14 million in its entirety for outdoor learning and instead using the current bond plus future bond proceeds to fund the BBH modernization. Right, thank you for that, because I was going to say that the H-22 says required, these changes require additional budget. Yeah. Those look like pretty significant yeah. changes that yeah. you can't do for $7 million. That is correct. That is correct. Which would bring the total to significantly over the normal range of a middle school or? Yes, um, kind of, again, more, we have not in our modernization, this has been kind of an ongoing conversation I've had since I arrived here and BVHM is um, my, uh, our first test case, right? That again, our modernization projects have been focused on health and safety and then some core kind of functionality upgrades. We have yet to do what I would call a curb to curb renovation. Um, but at BVHM, I would propose doing something much closer to that. So yes, that will be much higher than your typical um, modernization project that's been funded through the 2011 and 2016 bonds. Thank you. My last comment is that um, I've been visiting, oh, probably got to about 14, 15 schools by now in the last three months. Um, a comment is that a fresh paint job actually makes the place look so much better. And yeah. I think for, I don't think that's a very high cost thing that, you know, beyond the life and safety issues, if you can just maybe do that. <laughs> People would feel better. Inside and, and outside. In, inside and outside, yeah. I don't know how much it costs, but it makes, like when you go in, you just feel better because it's fresh uh, palette, I know colors and fresh paint and it just makes exactly. me feel better even if it's <laughs> tricky those projects are that kind of project is uh right in between maintenance and capital and so there are some sites for example gosh was it balboa where i made the same observation where you have so many millions of external square feet that repainting for example balboa high school is a capital project <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are other sites where you're just talking about a few rooms or the foyer that's actually much more consistent with maintenance funding and maintenance projects and so isn't eligible for bond dollars. So um, they fall in different categories. Um, but your point is well taken and I also have my own short list of sites that I think could really use a paint job. And I think to Commissioner Boja's questions earlier when we are talking about the capital condition assessment, we really do need feedback from site, leaver, site leaders and parents about the types of improvements that 
are like quality of life and user experience focus that may not be structural safety or life safety, but to your point, for me, playground rubber matting tiles falls into this category of things that like just makes a big difference when they're warped and coming apart versus intact and looking new. So I look forward to that feedback, getting that feedback from site leaders about which of those kinds of improvements can make a difference and whether it's through the GEO bond or maybe some other future funding um, conversation um, that we can think about what that plan could be. Yeah. I guess just following up on that, could you talk a little bit about kind of what your vision is for kind of like the district wide conversation that needs to happen around kind of capital projects that are coming up, uh, maintenance of buildings and kind of just like all the things that are happening, understanding we're kind of using consultants on individual projects, but just kind of like what is like the grander scope of that conversation? How do we get people involved kind of at the beginning versus after we've kind of had a lot of bad things? Well, I do think it's inevitable as you talk about bond planning and major capital projects that folks maintenance concerns surface right that is. Um, very predictable and I have been through that in the, the past bond cycles and um, bond programs that i've run. Um, but we do need to kind of track them separately and talk about them separately, I think. Um, in terms of the capital projects and how to engage the public, I actually do um, have a, a draft schedule that we'll be sharing in August that shows for the Board of Ed and the public the different types and ways to participate in a conversation. And I think just high level, what I would see happening is we would start with the condition assessment data and more detail around that. We would workshop that with the board to talk about what our overall 10 year capital plan priorities are, for example, ventilation right trying to come up with a strategy around ventilation, maybe schoolyards. Um, as well as general uh, life safety repairs and we would talk about and set a high level policy framework with feedback from the board and from the public through both workshops and also I was really impressed by the. It was um, interesting and validating to see the asynchronous workshop that we created for outdoor learning mirror the in person feedback we got so creating ways that we can. I'm excited about creating more asynchronous workshops that people can do self guided and um, provide feedback that way. As well as CBOC and um, other um, forums and presentations. Then once we have a 10 year framework with high level priorities, we will also begin to work with the board directly on okay well what projects do we want to sequence and scope. And I think one of our biggest policy discussions will be around the connection between that capital plan and the bond planning and um, to what extent do we want to plan for student assignment changes. Um, as part of that thinking right to what extent is it possible or desirable to connect those two conversations seems to me to be one of our most interesting and complicated questions to sort through. Thank you for that. I look forward to, to seeing that in August. I think one thing for me also would be the importance of figuring out how are we holding these conversations in the surrounding communities? Yeah. And how are we engaging City Hall and the Board of Supervisors and kind of those people mm -hmm. in the conversation as well? And I think one thing that I would love to see in August is like how how much should we be preparing to spend to kind of maintain the level of engagement we want to see across the district kind of for all of this just so that we can not just think about the work that you're going to be doing to kind of execute but like what do we need to do to bring people into the rooms and the spaces to give you the input and to participate fully thank you commissioner all right well thank you both for wonderful presentations today, very informative. And uh, we look forward to see you next time. Don't know when, but next time. Next time. We're going into recess at least for, yeah, okay. for July. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank everyone here too. Thank you. Everyone thank you. And this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>